All right, so the feedback here has been far too harsh, but this is a really tough cookie to crack when it comes to scoring, as it is good, even memorable, but flawed fun. Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, which I always misspell, is another wild and fun MCU movie that builds a lot out for the future. Too much. There's simply a lot going on. Too many characters, copious amounts of world building, which is good and bad, teases for the future, but like Ant-Man and the Wasp, the one before this, was sort of dismissed as forgettable fun and obvious setup for Endgame or filler, filler, not filler, to Endgame, this feels in some ways less forgettable, but obvious setup in the same way for the Kang Dynasty, otherwise known as Avengers 5, because it will be vital going forward. I loved the added focus on Janet and Hank Pym. As someone who always was a little sad that they weren't the main Ant-Man and the Wasp of the MCU, I'm big fans of theirs, that was much appreciated. However, with so much backstory sort of glossed over, I feel the need to mention that a Disney Plus series preceding this entitled The Quantum Realm, delving into Janet's history there with everyone and everything would have added tremendously to this film and it wouldn't have had to cross so many T's and dot so many I's because there's so much story missing and there's so much condensed. You don't get the motivations and the depth in that world building that I feel like it deserves because it is interesting. And as far as other characters go, Evangeline Lilly as Hope is a complete afterthought here, despite being in the title. Although you could argue that's more about Janet. Hope is mainly here to help service the plot when the action calls for it. Even Paul Rudd's arc as Scott Lang isn't as clear or noteworthy as it could have been, even though I appreciate his love for his daughter and the lengths that he goes for her in continuing that theme from the other movies. And Cassie is fine. She's your typical daughter of a superhero that has some grudge, teenage angst type, but she's also very cliche with her absolute worst decision-making abilities. And why do all these kids have to be superheroes now? It's also unfortunate that the actress from Endgame was recast and found out via social media. I wonder how she would have done. On the villain side, it was really fun to see Modoc, who unfortunately is brushed off mostly as a joke. I don't really mind the changes in making him more humorous here per se because he's always had that level of camp about him, but making him mostly a joke and not all that menacing is not like he's supposed to be. What they do with the character ultimately saddens me as it wastes the future, but honestly, I did laugh, and that approach might have been the best way to handle him in live action, but they could have done more to make him feel like a campy villain, less like a campy joke. Let's hope he comes back as the surprises with him are fun. I actually think he should have been the main villain to keep the trilogy's worth of story trimmed down here. There's so much story in this movie, I say that to say it could be a trilogy of movies just from how much they cram in here. And focusing on Modoc, maybe building up to Kang later, I think would have been a better option. But Jonathan Majors has gotten a lot of praise as Kang the Conqueror. And rightfully so. He steals any scene he is in. And this is a villain I have looked forward to since the MCU started. And this might be a bit of a hot take, but I don't think they did enough with him here. I know he'll be back later, but I never truly understood his motivations, abilities, backstory, or why he needed to do what he was doing beyond what I know from the comics and from Loki season one, which ties into theme that you have to watch a show to understand a movie more, which doesn't bother me per se, because I'm gonna watch it, but I can get why other people would have that criticism. Kang has the potential to become the best villain in the MCU since he'll get more appearances. He's menacing, electrifying, and intimidating, but he doesn't show up until almost the halfway point of the film, and I wanted more. Honestly, I think this movie did too, or they should have let Modoc be the villain and he shows up as a tease later. Not 100% there, but I'm not sold on this perfect villain showcase thing yet when they don't delve deep enough into the why behind this villain, obviously setting it up for later, but this was their chance to do that ahead of time. On the humor, it was fine. Some forced jokes here and there like usual MCU and a couple of actual pretty funny moments, but nothing laugh out loud. I appreciate them using it modestly though, kind of dialing it back and rain, knowing when to rein it in, even if it isn't the best. I've seen a lot of comments that is kind of meh CGI and I thought that it was actually pretty fantastic. And some of the best, or maybe I should say most consistent Marvel has had in a while, but the volume stagecraft technology, the same stuff that the Mandalorian made famous, is used too heavily. It's not as bad here as some other recent shows and films, but I could usually tell, and there were some scenes that just looked bad or off. The Bill Murray one in particular. It just does not look as good as green screen does with how far that technology comes and it needs to stop being used so much for this. I think it's more for a particular design set 
Marvel is relying on it too much, like with Thor Love and Thunder. And on that Bill Murray scene, I just feel like that whole cameo and performance was weird. I feel like I've talked fairly negatively about the film, but honestly, I did have fun with it. Getting to see the Microverse and the Micronauts, all the civilizations and world building were exquisite and deserving of their own spinoff. I got serious Star Wars nostalgia parts, Dune vibes, and strange reminders of Osmosis Jones. Even weirder, but it totally works. How the universe that started with Iron Man getting blown up by a missile in front of him, also as tiny jelly creatures who talk kindly to humans. Creative set pieces, effective use of darkness. This is pretty haunting for an Ant-Man movie. Memorable side characters who aren't developed at all, but so visually arresting that they're immediately endearing. There's a lot to love here and I want more of it, which is why I mentioned that spinoff earlier may have been a better idea ahead of time. Oh yeah, and those ants, were not talked about much and were a huge deus ex machina. Whoever thought we'd get a movie where Paul Rudd holds his own against Jonathan Majors, and it was great. It was a fun fight there at the end. While there's a lot to love here in the midst of the logical leaps and scatterbrained narrative, it ultimately loses some of the charm of the previous outings. It's not as forgettable, which I don't really think anymore, as the second movie, but there's a lot more iffy moments and I really like this, but XYZ feelings too. A friend of mine said that to me, and I think it's pretty apt here. One of the major issues in that sense is the absence of Luis in the XCOM group. They were highlights of both of the first two films and sorely missing here, especially those recaps Luis does. I really hope they find a way to make a return with them because I was sincerely hoping the post credit scene would feature them and talking about what happened, but they didn't. I get why they were cut, but it's unfortunate. Ultimately guys, make up your own minds. It doesn't deserve hate. It's a fun time at the movies. A kid in front of me clapped the whole time and at the, at the end said, best movie ever. And I think that means something and it helps me see the film in a different light. When you focus on all this movie does to further the already massive world of the MCU, but also do it pretty well and on something interesting, all the while captivating us with the powerhouse of a new villain that we know was coming back, that's commendable. Even if the ride has its bumps and jerks along the way, the highs are high and the lows are sort of head scratchers, but in time, I think the highs will be remembered more fondly. There's two post credit scenes here, fun teases for sure, setting up the future of the MCU. And I think that's ultimately what a lot of people will look at this as right now is just, it's a setup film for phase five. I give Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, 3.5 out of five stars. Thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Like this video and remember, always look for the good.